It's Noisy Andrew here. The entry to my board gaming was through old Avalon Hill hex and chip games. Um, it's always interested me why people bash the crap out of each other. And as such, I've been watching a video channel recently by a guy called Tick, who's not an insect or a cartoon character. He's a historian that breaks down mainly World War II battles. He may have done other ones. I think they're all World War II battles. Um, and recently, he has just finished the Crusader campaign in North Africa. Um, and a friend of mine actually showed some interest and started watching this with me. So every Monday when the game, when the videos came on, I was able to say, hey, blah, blah, blah. And she would go, blah, 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 that guy with the chair strapped to his tank. No, that really happened. Um, and at the end of it, I was like, we should try this old game I found. I've had this game for years and years. Never played it. I bought it as a collection item. I like collecting old things. If I can get something like this for 5 or $10 in a charity shop, I'm delighted. Anyway, so I convinced my friend who unwisely said yes. Come and sit. This is Kim, who I met at a board gaming club. Come this way, you're off shot, I think. There we are. I met at a board gaming club. So actually plays board games with us and my friends quite a bit has never played something like this. So grab that bit of paper there. The MO was, I would play by the seat of my pants. I don't play this sort of thing very often, uh, but I have a rough idea how it works. Kim would get a, um, what's this? A strategy, a strategy guide. Gun. And it was out of campaign magazine number something or other. We need to, I will put a comment here that thanks the person who, from Board Game Geek that actually showed us that. And we thought we'd have a go. We thought we'd play the game, the North African campaign, by an Australian designer from Victoria called John Edwards, has some rep about him, um, and see if A, we thought it was fun, B, what we thought about it, and also, there are no videos for this game online. So, well, not very many. Not Certainly not this 1973 charity shop edition. And like, well, I can sign my name in the dust on it, so you can see how little that's been used. It's basically sits on my shelf and I look at it wistfully and go, it'd be nice to try that. So Kim said she'd give it a go with me, like 10 hours worth of giving it a go, plus rule reading and what have you, as a new experience. Did you enjoy your new experience, mainly? I did, yes. Okay, <laughs> why don't we see how that went? So there's a separate chart in the box, which is called the tone record chart. And before you turn every move, you look at this to see if you'll get replacements, if you'll get um, air support, um, and in fact, if you'll have some withdrawals, like uh, some of the uh, allied units get taken away early in the game, so you can't use them. I believe they went off to Greece to try and rescue stuff that didn't work very well. Sadness. Because I wasn't paying attention to that. <laughs> um, yeah, surprising for the commander, as it probably would have been in 1941. They probably didn't expect to get their shit taken off them in the middle of a fight. But anyway, if you look down the left-hand side of the chart, you can see there's two turns uh, per month. So on the first turn of a month, you look at the chart, you see what you get. Um, air power, replacements, and actual units. Um, if you look at the top up here, you can actually see we've laid out all the units on like a sheet of paper in the correct position so we can find them. Because in this game, you spend a lot of time taking a unit that's taken damage off the board and replacing it with the same unit but a separate counter that's a little bit less powerful. And some of the big units have like four counters that represent them and you use the little one when it's nearly dead and you use the big one when it's like kicking seals or something. <laughs> yes, that strategy article suggested that the Allies start by attacking the Italians at City Barani. Right. So, having no idea what I'm doing, thought, let's start there. <laughs> Go. Terrible this. Okay. Um, so, on your chit, for your units, the two larger numbers at the bottom represent the combat factor and the movement factor. On the left is the combat factor, and the movement factor is on the right. So, when your unit moves, it can move one hex per movement factor. You get a bonus if you're moving along the road. It gets to move five hexes per movement factor. And if a unit moves onto a ridge... Which looks like pubic hair. 
So <laughs> when a unit moves onto a ridge, it may move along the ridge but not off or across it in that same turn. So yes. you have to wait till the next turn for that. And that's pretty much all there is to moving. I have to say, the ridge rule doesn't sound like very much, but later in the game when I wanted to do some manoeuvring, it was a pain in the ass. Okay. So while we're here, I think we can talk about how combat works. Um, the pieces have moved up to the pieces they're going to attack, the counters. Um, and the rule is, if you're next to another counter, you have to fight it. And if it's your turn, then you're regarded as the attacker and the other person is regarded as the defender. And this is important because just above this, you can see on the board there's, an, there's a table with lots of ARs and BRs and Cs on it. That's a combat results chart. Um, across the top of that, there are odds. Um, and you want the odds in your favour, particularly if you're the attacker, because if the odds are not in your favour, like defending is an easier thing to do than attacking. So you want to try and attack on good odds. And what we have here is a New Zealand and Australian division attacking a BS division. So their odds are 10 to 2, which works out at um, te uh, 5 to 1, he said, doing maths badly. And an Indian 4th division attacking the Libya division, which works out at 4 to 1. Um, so you can see all the units that are next to each other are involved in a combat. Um, you have to make sure, even if there's some piddly little unit on the side, you need to attack it if you're next to it. You can't like surround one unit with massive odds and then just ignore one that's next door to it. So once you have your combat odds, the next thing you do is roll a dice. Um, and there's just a six sided dice with result of one to six, uh, which is pretty fucking random. But here's the thing. After watching Tick's video, we realized that a lot of really random stuff happens that's outside the control of the commanders in the desert, or probably in any theatre of war, actually. And so the dice isn't just talking about how the battle went. It's talking about whether units were able to get there, whether they were in the right mood to fight, whether they were properly fed and armed. Like, all of this sort of stuff isn't necessarily well understood or known by the guy in a tent some way back when who's basically telling people they need to conduct an assault on something. So... Initially, I was like, oh, one to six sided dice. What if I roll crap and things go wrong? But this is actually not a bad um, description of the sort of fog of war stuff. The things you, all your best laid plans can easily come unstuck in war. With. And so I think the one to six sided dice um, has a little bit more of my respect now that I've played this game than it would have otherwise. That's just because I rolled terrible numbers. <laughs> Admit it. Yes, yes, there was some terrible rolling by the Allies in this. Um, General Wavell got sacked and replaced by Orkinlek because he couldn't roll a <laughs> dice. Okay, so we played a vintage game today and this was the rule book that we learned from uh, until we came across some things that we didn't understand. So there was a version 2 of the rule book, which I believe is 1978 printing or something that you could get online somewhere i don't know where and then later in the game we uh ran into a problem with the pubic hair i mean ridges and um like there was some complaints by a certain allied unit as to what the germans were doing so we had some clarification and someone on board game geek helped us uh go to the compass games web page where we downloaded the rules for compass games's uh beautified version Although I understand the board is not mounted. Cardboard people. And uh, some of the counters were printed incorrectly or something, but evidently Compass Games picks that up for you. So before we wrap, or with the beginning of the wrap, I think it would be nice to just say, what's your favourite game? Oregon. Oregon. So how does this compare to Oregon as a gaming experience? Like, very different. Yes. <laughs> Specifically length, for starters. That doesn't make it bad. That doesn't make it bad. No, we, we played, I think we played for roughly six hours. If you delete time for eating, looking at rules, arguing about stuff, reading rules, and sorting out counters. So much sorting out of counters. Um, when I read the rules, I was like, it's going to be difficult, like, keeping track of, like, what counters are where. And I noticed there was a slip of paper in my copy that said, Sort the counters out before you start, otherwise you'll be forever looking at counters. It was right. We sorted out the counters. Actually, 
Kim saw she had the cactus. It was like a, it's like doing your jigsaw. It was. <laughs> um, the other thing about the game I thought was interesting is I actually got the feeling of like what happened in North Africa to some degree. Actually, I, I can understand the, the challenges and difficulties that commanders of those sides had. Um, and having watched Tick's uh, various video, videos about those battles in North Africa um, actually made the playing experience more interesting. I don't think I would have convinced this person to play this game with me if she had not got engaged and invested because of the videos. Is it worth watching Tick's videos? Definitely. Yeah, they're long. Um, and they're not... nine hours to stay. <laughs> So for me, this is like the first time I've actually finished one of these strategy, strategic level Hex Encounter games. Hex, Hex Encounter games, yes. And I've played things like Tobruk, and at one point uh, in my 20s, I played a bit of Squad Leader, actually, uh, before it got complicated and expensive with folders of rules. Um, but really, my experience here is actually fairly limited. Total greeny, like as cabbage as green can be um, so it was really interesting like introducing someone with this little experience to something that's quite new and out of the um, ordinary or their normal comfort zone which is clearly euro games oregon euro games so would you recommend like having a crack at this and, and like if you were if you were thinking about it um because it's not for everybody is it no no. You need time to invest in, in <laughs> reading the rules yeah. and playing the game. For us, it was a Friday afternoon after work and then till about one o'clock on Saturday. And we started early. <laughs> so. And you need the right people to play it with. Yeah, yeah. Like you know. Because it's too far. That's right. I don't know how people play these things solitaire. I really enjoy the interaction with other players, but a lot of these games, because of what they are, are solitaire. So. If you were going to play it again, how long would you do? Would you would you would you try it again? Or because I mean, <laughs> you need revenge clearly. <laughs> um, of course, I'd play it again. Um, probably, I'd want to play it soonish, within the next three months or so. Did one, you? One, I want to wake it to the end. Yeah. <laughs> December nineteen forty-two. Didn't get there. No, uh, didn't get into nineteen forty-two. <laughs> Um, and also interesting to play from the other side because so yeah. I was the allies. And, and how much was the way you played affected by a uh, certain investment in someone called Jock Campbell? Jock Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> For those that don't know, watch Tick's documentary. There's a, um, a, a British uh, brigadier, I think, uh, a British officer who is part of this campaign uh, in the Crusader campaign who, seriously, his exploits have to be seen to be believed. He has a fan right here. <laughs> and that's sort of... Crazy. And, and, and every time the, the unit that we knew <laughs> contained Jock Campbell, which is the 7th Armoured Brigade, uh, was doing something, she was like... I was right into it. <laughs> well, I had to abandon the strategy early on because it didn't go to plan, so... Back up, Jock yeah. Campbell... Yeah, that's it's supposed right. to be for the win, but it didn't yeah. happen. Uh, she hung about to dry at the end. <laughs> I didn't want to. So, <laughs> so cut, so cut. So hopefully this helps you if you've been curious about these old Hex and Counter War games that take forever. One last thing. Do you reckon the rules in this were hard to learn? No, we had to check some things. But... Yes, yeah. I think that goes with the, um, with the, the territory, like... You, you do find yourself referencing the rules. Avalon Hill rules are terrible. Like, these rules here, terrible. If you've got a, an old copy of this, these rules by Compass Games are better. They've got some really good examples in them. It's longer because of that. This is only like a few pages. Um, but yeah, they certainly saved our, um, some, some arguments really, basically, arguments. <laughs> Um, and um, and I will put a thank you in the comments below to the person who put us onto this as well on Board Game Geek. Thank you for watching. <laughs>